Cyril, then you mentioned uh, Pope Benedict. Do you think the present Pope, Pope, Pope Francis, has changed the climate surrounding all of this? And, and even, I suppose, I'd like to ask you, do you think there's more of a note of optimism oh, with, with him being in charge? Definitely. He has changed the atmospherics. This is my favourite word at the moment. It's a sort of a generalised um, view of the the tone, the sensibility, others' perceptions, perceptions within, uh, out, uh, uh, looking out. Definitely he's changed the tone a lot. And in fact, it's staggering to me, given that really he hasn't said an awful lot about the sexual abuse crisis at all. But somehow he has suggested a humbler church trying to serve, um, going back to its roots, and people have just swallowed it up like... It's amazed me because I thought that, that people would want a lot more redemptive acts, but they don't. They seem to be so desirous of um, the church appearing to get back to core business, which is, I think, very, very interesting. Um, and, I mean, I think the truth is that the pews haven't emptied out yet, so we've almost had... Something has happened inside the church, I think, along the lines of what I'm saying. Damn it all, this is not the, the full story of my church. I'm not going to let it be, because it's not. But I also can't deny the fact that it is a terrible part of the story. And so I think there's a lot of people who are agnostic and atheists who have firmed up in their hostility, but strangely enough... Inside the church, that is not a fair representation of attitudes. And Adam, uh, what what would be your reflection on on uh, the present Pope and his um, influence on this? Yeah, I mean, I liked Pope Benedict, but Francis feels like the first Pope, the, my first Pope, you know, if you want to put Does it that he? way. Yeah, I think his demeanour is just his his spirit, his kind of candour, all that kind of thing is really inspiring. Even though I don't think he's an innovator at all you know he's kind of straight up and down to me um well i think what he's done largely has been to correct some of the process matters around it so there's the you know new tribunal is set up and there'll be the first kind of child abuse that the first vatican trial of a of an abuser which i think is an amazing achievement finally probably 15 years too late but nonetheless you know here it is um but yeah i think the best thing about about francis is for him to say um, for him to be so merciful and, and, and loving and it's, his, it's that tendency you know, for him to basically say Look, this, is, this could be corrected just on the level of attitude right. largely you, know, you could just be more approachable be more generous your heart less hard all those kinds of things and it would have made a world of difference to people I think in their experiences with the church you know, so much of what you get through towards healing and the Melbourne response how much the criticisms that people had was that they just never thought the church was actually listening to them in any sense. You know, they would turn up to these sessions and say, you know, really what we want is an apology and some very small amount of money. Like even um, John Ellis only wanted about $100,000 or mm. something like that really in the end. And the only reason that these things broke down was because the church was too hard, you know. And so I think Francis is doing some good work there. Like he's Yes, but he... But but he st but he he doesn't want <laughs> they're still not super curious yeah about what this all arose from they're not and um because it's so shameful mm. it's so dreadful and it's <laughs> it is such a repudiation as i say of of the good shepherd and the notion of protecting yeah. the the people uh, who who are there so, and I, I, I even partly understand, you know, when something is... It's almost like a dissociative state. Oh, I'll just avert my gaze. Now, I think that is a real pity. But, but equally, I, if I genuinely can say I did not know this was going on in the church I grew up in, I had one friend who was abused, and it has made a big impact on her life, but every, I had no idea... What do, I, what do I do then? Like, uh, it's, it's simply not a true representation of the vast amount of generosity of spirit I saw in the, saw, saw in the church. Mm. So uh, I sort of feel like before I end my days, I hope 
that a bigger story of the church is told, which is a truer overall representation. I feel that might be what's asked of me, while not repudiating this, these facts. But that's what I'm really wrestling with now. Can you talk um, a bit more just about the journey that you've been on in coming to terms with this? Um, like, has there been different stages in it? Do you feel you're at the end of it or still in the middle of it? Um, um, like, what, what has been the journey in coming to terms with sexual abuse in the church? I think, Peter, it's been about a 20-year journey because I actually started reporting on it back in the late 90s and early noughties. And I um, did some very demanding stories down, for instance, in Wollongong, which had had some terrible cases. And I felt quite impressed with the Towards Healing in, in particular. I thought, the process is underway. It's recognised. The officials are doing their job. I can get back to being a good parishioner, you know, doing my own search. Um, I had some very strong um, people in my life. My, my late husband, who was an atheist, said, this hasn't gone away, Gerald, and he said. And I had a very strong Anglican colleague who sort of said, this has not nearly gone away. And I thought they were wrong. I thought, look, this is essentially um, being dealt with. It's awful, but it's been dealt with. And then gradually, as I said, I went to some very dark places of... I couldn't believe the cover-ups. It wasn't the sexual abuse. It was the cover-ups and the moving people around. I really found that deeply, deeply upsetting. And then I, w I went through that stage of that, I think, a couple of documentaries that deeply upset me. Then I emerged and I thought, damn it all. I'm not going to stay in this despair. And then the Royal Commission was announced. <laughs> and I was sort of sent back into it. And actually, I felt I'd emerged from the awful places. And, um, but I felt I was much more alone in my search uh, than I had been. So, so they were the component parts. And no, I don't feel it's over yet. And, and Adam, what, what about you? Do you, do you feel as if, um, you know, there have been stages of different stages of, of your view on what's been going on? Yeah, I think by the time I started really reporting on the commission, I'd already kind of given up on the church and the, the process of conversion that I was going through and I'd gone to the, the high Anglicans. So I felt no obligation to really to be um, generous or to go easy. So I didn't, um, largely in any of the writing I did. Um, at the same time, I was also meeting some victims, not many, like I won't hold out that I have a big connection with a lot of people, but I did meet, meet some, including Nikki Davis, who's quite public, is one of these public fig figures who marshals a lot of people and represents in a kind of, um, in, in some sense represents a lot of people who are probably too traumatised to speak for themselves. Mm. And so I learned really quickly after speaking with her and a couple of other people how difficult a lot of victims' lives are, and how um, how uh, yeah. I mean, there are people who will. Doesn't matter what the outcome of the Royal Commission is, you know, they'll never come back from it. So that's, I think, very difficult to comprehend. Given that my struggle with the church is, you know, for a long time was, oh, do I want to go back because I like the choirs in this Anglican church? I'm yeah. at. That was that. That's the full extent. You know what I mean? And now it's it's obviously your spiritual life deepens out, but. At some stages, that was basically as hard as it was, and I couldn't make up, or oh, do I read this particular theologian or this other one? You know, meanwhile, there are people whose lives were totally destroyed by the institution that they cared most about. So I think um, that was quite confronting for me to learn that and then to go through a, a separate process of trying to square that with myself. You know, how do you become a part mm. of a corrupt, an organisation that is widely considered to be not just corrupt but also evil and to have people your own age think that you're insane for wanting to do that, first of all. And second of all, going, oh, okay, it's rational that you want to be a Christian, but why would you choose the church full of pedophiles? Yeah, yeah, and you see, and that sort of really eventually started to annoy the life out of me. Really? But yeah, yeah, really did. That Because it wasn't full of pedophiles and it wasn't a corrupt institution. You know, that's exactly my... I started to really struggle yeah. with the... Like, I, I started to believe that there were some people who were just piling in 
and having a big go and refusing, you know, refusing to see it's the biggest supplier of charity mm. in this country other than the government, for God's sake. Yeah. And just knowing the people who are still striving and struggling to support people. So that started to really bug me. To be more forward-looking and I suppose more constructive and, and thinking now about, well, how do you rebuild from this? What things in there have you found helpful? Where do you get inspiration and where, how do you see the rebuilding happening? Well, I have gone back to the history of the church in Australia and I think it was the first nearly 40 years there was no clergy here. Yeah. The, the, it, it's extraordinary to realise this. So that this little church hung on and people got on and established in the colony such as it was uh, until the Benedictines arrived, the, uh, the English arrived. And I actually, f I'm choosing to find that immensely hope-filling. And to me, I keep going back to that and hanging on and saying, something is being asked of me here. Probably small-scale work. The other thing I'm trying to do is not to think too big. Um, I'm working, trying to work in groups that I know, but in adjacent parishes and trying to work with people who um, think about uh, working in their communities. So to sort of starting small, I mean, I suppose it's subsidiarity principle, funnily enough, in practice... And um, and just trying to work out sort of sort of small concentric circles out, and gradually start to build again a bit of confidence, um, but not going back, not imagining that we're going to sort of rush back to that gorgeous uh, quotes, you know, gorgeous old set of structures. The one thing that will stymie any effort to get there will be if the church does not broker a good settlement at the end of the commission. And I think, you know, you're looking at the moment at it potentially coming undone, you know, the federal government's refusing to support the kind of redress scheme that the commission is recommending, the church is pushing very hard for it. I think in a generous way, realising that child abuse is a whole of society problem, not just something that can be sorted out through civil litigation mm. and that kind of thing. They're saying we need a one-stop shop, you know, supported by mm. the federal government or the state governments, mm. the institutions that are involved in abuse so that um, there is a good, just outcome for everyone. And I think if we don't get there, then that'll be a massive problem. And I think, I didn't, I didn't always think it. I thought from the very beginning that groups like the Truth, Justice and Heal Healing Council were, um, when, I, when I first started writing about them, I thought they were very mendacious, but I don't think that anymore. I think that they're really, they know what the problem is, which is that mm -hmm. if they don't get this, then it will destroy the church's moral witness internally and externally if they can't manage to broker a decent settlement that produces a just outcome for, for victims i think it's absolutely crucial and that we can kind of sit here and talk about parish renewal and all that kind of stuff but if they're not taken care of at the end of the day then we may as well pack up and go home look uh, yeah i don't have quite that same view as you oh look i actually believe they've got that they've, they've got to be in there um looking for justice but i also I think it is a nonsense to imagine that however good this turns out, people's lives, they're going to feel serene. They're oh, not. Of course they won't. And it rather annoys me that the media in particular seems to hold out the idea that there is a neat solution. I don't think there yeah, is. No. Oddly enough, what I have realised when thinking about this interview is that I've actually found the liturgy incredibly helpful. So in the midst of this <laughs> bewilderment, you know, trying to wrestle with where did one sit in conscience? Yeah. Were you just hanging on to some pathetic institution just because it was part of your identity? Did you not have the guts to step away? And, you know, really thinking about it, um, I actually would find the liturgy, which is the heritage, um, terrific. Now, not as, I'm not as regular a mass goer as I used to be, but then I'm not raising children now. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's come at a certain time in my life I'm, I'm actually more of a searcher now in some ways, I think, honestly searching, asking what it asks of me, um, setting up things in my parish, you know, we've done, I'm, so I'm becoming constructive, using my energy to have terrific discussions about the encyclicals, the joy of the gospel and the latest yeah. one. But 
I really found um, the mass um, benediction when it happens uh, a, a, a beautiful choral service whenever you get them in the, <laughs> in the Catholic Church um, a, a, a moment of prayer meditation I found that very very helpful and actually I think that was a little bit of a turning point because I thought oh, ah yeah. this is the real yeah. this is the enduring part of it um, so know that know that and have confidence in it Thank you.